Chapter 38 The Visit we purpose to follow the history of Richard Markham a little farther ere we return to Eliza Sidney, whose adventures after her release from Newgate will, it is believed, excite the liveliest interest in the minds of the readers. As soon as Mr. Monroe had taken his departure, Richard made Whittingham acquainted with his altered prospects, and they two together settled certain economical alterations in the establishment at the place which were calculated to meet the limited means of its master, who, it will be remembered, was now of age, and consequently invested with the control of the little property that the villainy of George Montague had left him. Markham then proceeded, attended by Whittingham, to visit the various apartments of the old mansion from which he had been so long absent, and each recalled to his mind reminiscences that circumstances had made painful. In one apartment he had been wont to sit with his revered father of an evening and survey the adjacent scenery in the mighty city from the windows. In another he had pursued his studies with the dearly loved brother whom he had lost. Whichever way he turned, visions calculated to oppress his mind rose before him. He felt like a criminal who had disgraced an honorable name, and even the very pictures of his ancestors appeared to frown upon him from their antique and dust-covered frames. But when he entered the room where the spirit of his father had taken its leave of this world, his emotions almost overpowered him. He wept aloud, and even the old butler did not now endeavor to comfort him. He had returned, branded with shame, to a house where he had received an existence that was full of hope and honor. He had come back to a dwelling in the rooms of which were hung the portraits of many great and good men who were his ancestors, but amongst whom his own likeness could never take a place for fear that some visitor to that mansion should write the words freed convict upon the frame. For though conscience reproached him not for guilt, the world would not believe his innocence. That night he could not sleep, and he hailed the dawn of morning as a shipwrecked mariner upon the rafts beholds the signal of assistance in the horizon. He rose and hastened to the hill, where he seated himself upon the bench between the two trees. There he gave free vent to his tears, and he was relieved. Suddenly his eye caught sight of letters carved upon the bark of his brother's tree. He looked closer, and to his indescribable joy he beheld these characters rudely, hit, rudely cut deeply into the tree. Eugene, December 25th, 1836. My brother lives, exclaimed Richard, clasping his hands together. This is an intimation of his remembrance of me. But, oh, why did he desert me in my need? Wherefore came he not to see me in my prison? Alas, years must yet elapse ere I clasp him to my heart. Let me not repine, let me not reproach him without hearing his justification. He has revisited the hill, and he chose a sacred day for what he no doubt deemed a sacred duty. It was on the anniversary of the Nativity of the Savior that he came back to the scenes of his youth. Oh, Eugene, I thank you for this. It is an assurance that the appointment on the 10th of July, 1843, will be punctually kept. From the moment when his eyes rested upon the memorial of his lost brother thus carved upon the bark of the tree, Richard's mind became composed and, indeed, comparatively happy. His habits, however, grew more and more secluded and reserved, and he seldom ventured into that mighty Babylon whose snares had proved so fatal to his happiness. <laughs> I can't say I blame him. He's like, the last time I ventured down there after being away, I got in a lot of trouble. So mm, you don't blame me, Richard. One day, it was about the middle of March, 1838, Richard was surprised by the arrival of a phaeton and pair at his abode, and he eagerly watched from the window to ascertain who could have thought of paying him a visit. In a few minutes, he was delighted to see Mr. Armstrong, the political martyr with whom he had become acquainted in Newgate, alight from the vehicle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is the guy who had been like a newspaper writer and had been thrown in prison for a lot of things that he'd been accused of but wasn't guilty of, but George Montague had um, cl uh, claimed that he was guilty of them and got him in trouble for it. Richard hastened to welcome him with the most unfeigned sincerity. You see, I have found you out, my dear young friend, said Armstrong. I miscalculated the date of your release from that abominable hole and a few weeks ago was waiting for hours one day at Giltspur Street to welcome you to freedom. Oh, he went to welcome him out. I like this guy. At length, I did what I ought to have done at first, that is, inquired of the turnkeys whether you were to be released that day or not, and behold, I found that the bird had flown. I should have written to you, said Richard, for you are kind enough to give me your address, but really my mind has been so bent upon solitude. From which solitude, interrupted Armstrong, smiling, I am come to drag you away. Will you allow me to dispose of the next ten days for you? 
How do you mean, my good friend, inquired Markham. I mean that you shall pass the time with me at the house of a friend at Richmond. Solitude and seclusion will never wean you from the contemplation of your past sorrows. He's right. Richard does need to get out and away from his own thoughts, but it seems like every time Richard leaves the house, he gets in trouble, so I'm a little worried. Ah, uh, but you know that I cannot go into society again, said Richard. This is absurd, Markham. I will hear no apologies. You must and shall place yourself at my disposal, returned the old gentleman in a kind and yet positive manner. But to whom do you wish to introduce me, inquired Markham. To an Italian emigrant who has only just arrived in this country with his family, but the honor of whose friendship I have enjoyed for many, many years. Oh, I wonder if it's the guy that we read the letter about in that uh, chapter where the people in the post office were opening mail. It's got to be him, right? Because why else would they mention him? Hmm. Oh, it's getting all mixed together. Uh, I must tell you that I have traveled much, and that Italy has always been a country which has excited my warmest sympathy. It was at Montoni, the capital of the Grand Duchy of Castelcicala, yeah, that's the one we were learning about, that I first met Count Alteroni, and his extremely liberal political opinions, which completely coincide with my own, were the foundation of a staunch friendship between us. Ten years ago, he was compelled to fly from his native land, and he sought refuge in England. His only child, a beautiful girl of the name Isabella, thus obtained an English education and speaks the language fluently. Two years ago, he was allowed to return to Italy, but a few months back, fresh political events in that state forced him once more to become an exile. He arrived in England a month ago and has taken a small but commodious and picturesque residence at Richmond. His means are ample, but not vast, and he therefore lives in comparative seclu seclusion. Other reasons, moreover, inducing him to avoid the pomp and ostentation which noblemen of his rank usually maintain. Thus, in addressing him, you must drop the formal formality of my lord, and remember also that his daughter chooses to be called simply Miss As Isabella, or the Signora Isabella. And how can I venture to present myself to this nobleman of high rank and his wife and daughter, knowing that but a few weeks ago I was liberated from jail, demanded Richard bitterly. The Count has not heard of your misfortune and is not likely to do so, answered Armstrong. He pressed me yesterday to pass a few days with him, and I happened to mention that I was about to visit a young friend, meaning yourself, in whom I felt a deep interest. I then gave him such an account of you that he expressed a desire to form your acquaintance. Thus you perceive that I am taking no unwarranted liberty in introducing you to his house. As for the danger which you incur of your history being known, that cannot be avoided, and it is a point which you may as well risk now as upon any future occasion." A man of the world must always be prepared for reverses of this kind, and I think that I am not mistaken in you, Markham, when I express my opinion that you would know how to vindicate your character and assert your innocence in a manner which would disarm resentment and conquer prejudice. At least assume as cheerful an appearance as possible, and believe me, you will find yourself right welcome at the dwelling of Count Alteroni. Reassured by remarks of this nature and warmed by the generous friendship displayed towards him by the Republican writer, Markham's countenance again wore a smile and he felt more at ease than he had done ever since his misfortune. The pr presence of one who took an interest in his welfare, the prospect of enjoying pleasant society, and the idea of change of scene combined to elevate his spirits and create new hopes in his breast. He began to think that he was not altogether the solitary, deserted, and sorrow-doomed being he had so lately considered himself. <gasps> I want to hope that's true. I want to hope this is the start of a happy chapter for Richard, but... <laughs> So far, nothing ever stays that way in this story. Okay, let's all hope that it turns out good. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon that the Phaeton, in which rode Markham and his friend the Republican, entered a spacious shrubbery, through which a wide avenue led to the front door of a very beautiful country residence near Richmond. The dwelling was not large, but its external appearance seemed to bear ample testimony to its interior comfort. A domestic in a plain and unpretending livery appeared at the door the moment the phaeton stopped, and the Count himself met his visitors in the hall to welcome their arrival. The nobleman shook hands with Armstrong in the most cordial manner, and when Richard was introduced to him, he received him with a courtesy and warm affability which showed how much any friend of Armstrong's was valued by the Italian exile. The guests were ushered into the drawing room, where the Countess and her daughter and two gentlemen were also visitors, and were seated. But while we allow Richard time to get acquainted with the family of the Italian noble, we must give the reader a brief description of the new characters now introduced upon the stage. Okay, brace yourselves. We're about to learn about new people. I have a feeling I'm going to have to do another um, recap video because <laughs> it's all getting a little bit complicated. Count Alteroni was about 40 years of age. His hair and whiskers, originally of a deep black, were tinged prematurely with gray, but his mustachios were of the darkest jet. 
His complexion was of a clear olive, in figure he was tall, well-formed, and muscular, though slight. His countenance was expressive of great dignity, one would almost say of conscious superiority, but this softness of aspect and the nobility of demeanor which distinguished him failed to produce any unpleasant impression, inasmuch as everyone who approached the Count was charmed by the affability of his manners and the condescending kindness of his tone. The Countess was about two years younger than her husband, and was of a complexion and cast of countenance which denoted her northern origin. In fact, she was a German lady of high birth. But she spoke Italian, French, and English, English with as much facility as her own tongue. But what of Isabella? I've been curious about Isabella, too. To say that she was beautiful was to say nothing. Her aspect was resplendent with all those graces which innocence lavishly diffuses over the lineaments of loveliness. She was 16 years old, and her dark black eyes were animated with all the fire of that impassioned age, when even the most rugged paths of life seem adorned and strewed with flowers. Her mouth was small, but the lips were full and pouting, and revealed, when she smiled, a set of beautifully white and even teeth. Her hair was dark as the raven's wing, and was invariably arranged in the most natural and simple manner. Her brows were exquisitely penciled, and as her large black eyes were the mirror of her pure and guileless soul, when she glanced downward, those expressive orbs were concealed by their long black fringes. It seemed as if she were drawing a veil over her thoughts. Her complexion was that of a brunette, but the pure red blood shone in her vermilion lips and her rose-tinted nostrils, and mantled her pure brow with a crimson hue when any passion was excited. Her sylph-like figure was modeled with the most perfect symmetry. Her waist was so delicate and her hands and feet so small that it was easy to perceive she came of patrician blood. And the swell of her bosom gave a proper roundness to her form without expanding into proportions that might be termed voluptuous. All right. <laughs> In manners, disposition, and accomplishments, Isabel was equally calculated to charm all her acquaintances. Having finished her education in England, she had united all the solid morality of English manners with the sprightliness and vivacity of her native clime, and as she was without levity and frivolity, she was also entirely free from any insipid and ridiculous affectations. She was alertness itself. Her manners commanded universal respect, and her bearing alone repressed the impertinence of the libertine's gaze. With a disposition naturally lively, she was still attached to serious pursuits, and her mind was well sorted with all useful information and embellished with every feminine accomplishment. Interesting. Now, she's only 16, which to a modern reader makes us think of her in the role of a young person. But at this time in the 1830s, 16 was basically grown up for a, for a girl or a woman, so I'm not sure how this author is going to play her character because at this time she's at an age where we could kind of go either way so we'll see the two gentlemen who were present in the drawing room when armstrong and richard arrived were two young beaux members of the aristocracy and this was their only recommendation <laughs> sometimes this author has turns of phrase that just make me laugh it was not, however, on this account that they had obtained a footing in the Count's abode, but because they were nearly related to a deceased English general who had taken part with the Italians against the French during the career of Napoleon, and had been of essential service to the family to which the Count belonged. With regard to their exterior, suffice it to say that they were dressed in the extreme of fashion. One was very effeminate in appearance, having neither whiskers nor the slightest appearance of a beard, and the other was rather good-looking, sported an incipient mustachio, and wore an undress military uniform. The effeminate young gentleman was intro introduced to Armstrong and Markham by the name of Sir Cherry Bounce. Cherry Bounce. <laughs> Sometimes these names I'm like, are you? messing with us and the mustachioed one as the honorable smilax dapper a captain at the age of 20 in his majesty's regiment of hushers during the hour which intervened between the arrival of the new guests and the announcement of dinner a conversation ensued which will serve to throw some light upon the characters of those in inmates of the hospitable abode whom we have as yet only partially introduced to our readers you reside in a very pleasant and healthy part of London, Mr. Markham, said the Count. I am well acquainted with the situation of your mansion and grounds from the description which my friend Armstrong has given me. The house stands close by a hill, on the summit of which are two trees. Ah, indeed, said Sir Cherry Bounce. The other day I rode by there for the first time in my life, and I remember the house is very beautifully situated in the neighborhood of the hill described by the Count, and with two ash trees on the top. That is my house, said Richard, but it is an antiquated, gloomy-looking pile, and, oh, I beg your pardon, sir, it is the sweetest little place I ever saw. 
I never thought, saw it but that time and was struck with the very remarkable appearance of the hill and the trees. Those trees were planted many years ago by my brother and myself, said Markham, a deep shade of melancholy suddenly overclouding his countenance. And they yet remain there as the trysting mark for a strange appointment. Indeed, said the Count, and as Richard saw that Isabella was also interested in his observations, he determined to gratify the sentiment of curiosity which he had excited. It is nearly seven years since that event took place. My elder brother disputed with my father and determined to leave home and choose some career for himself which he hoped might lead to fortune. He and I parted upon that hill beneath those trees with the understanding that in twelve years we were to meet again upon that same spot and then compare our respective fortunes and worldly positions. On the 10th of July, 1848, that appointment is to be kept. And during the seven years which have already elapsed, have you received no tidings of your brother? inquired Isabella. None direct, answered Markham. All that I know is that on Christmas Day, 1836, he was alive, for he went to the hill while I was absent from home and carved his name upon the tree that he himself planted. Strike me stupid if that isn't the most romantic thing I ever heard of, exclaimed Captain Dapper, caressing his mustachio. <laughs> we ought to write a copy of that upon the remarkable incident in Miss Isabella's album, observed Sir Cherry Bounce. So I would strike me if I was half such a good poet as you, Cherry, returned the captain. You wrote some very pretty poetry the other day upon the great sea serpent, said the effeminate baronet, and I don't know why you wouldn't do the same by the two ash trees. Yes, but strike me ugly. <laughs> he said, strike me ugly. I wonder if Whittingham would be upset if he said that to him. He's still upset about being called a tulip, so... <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yes, but strike me ugly. Miss Ella Isabella would not let me insert them in her album, observed the captain, and that was very unkind. Bella says that you undertook to finish a butterfly and spoilt it, exclaimed this count, laughing. And now it seems for the world like an enormous frog, said Sir Cherry. Now really, Bounce, that is too bad, drawled the captain, playing with his mustachio. I appeal to the signora herself whether the butterfly was so very, very bad. Considering it to be your first attempt, said the young lady, it was not so very much amiss. And I must say that I preferred the butterfly to the lines upon the sea serpent. <laughs> so yeah, your butterfly was terrible, but it was better than your poem. <laughs> well, may I perish? <laughs> Strike me ugly. <laughs> if I think the lines were so bad, but we will refer them to Mr. Markham. Not that I dispute Miss Isabella's judgment. I'd rather have my mustachios signed than do that, but... Signed? Singed! <laughs> I, mean, I guess you wouldn't want your mustache signed either. I'd rather have my mustachios singed than do that. But the verses, the verses, cried Sir Cherry. I'm afraid that my talent does not justify such a reference to it, said Markham. I should rather imagine that Mrs. Bella's decision will admit of no appeal. My dear sir, we will have your opinion. The verses were composed in a hurry, and they may not be quite so excellent and faultless as they might be. I only devoted half an hour to them, strike me if I did. Let's see, how do they begin, continued the young baronet of 19. Oh, I remember. The opening is simple, but ex... Oh, expressive. <laughs> My gosh, these two guys are going to be the death of me. Okay, the opening is simple, but expressive. Through the sea the serpent rolls, moving ever twixt the poles, frightening herrings, pros and souls, in his progress rapid, swallowing up the mighty ships by the suction of his lips. Onward still the monster trips like... Well, strike me, interrupted the captain, if I ever heard poetry spouted like that before. Please listen to me, Markham. This is the way the poem opens. Through the sea the serpent rolls, moving ever twixt the poles, frightening herring sprats and souls in his progress rapid, swallowing up the mighty ships by the motion of his lips. Onward still the monster trips like, no, that isn't the way, cried Sir Cherry. Well, strike me if I'll say another word more then, returned the captain, apparently very much inclined to cry. <laughs> These two are hilarious. I am sure Miss Isabella was wrong not to have inserted these verses in her album, said Armstrong, with a smile of good-natured satire. But I know that my young friend Mr. Markham has a more refined taste with regard to poetry than he chose just now to admit. Indeed, said the beautiful Isabella, I should be delighted to hear Mr. Markham's sentiments upon the subject of poetry, for I confess that I myself entertain very singular notions in that respect. It is difficult to afford a... 
minute definition of what poetry is, for like the unearthly visitants which the fears of superstition have occasionally summoned to the world, poetry fascinates the senses but eludes the grasp of the beholder and stands before him visible, powerful, and yet impalpable. I concur with your views, Miss Isabella, said Markham, delighted to hear amidst the frivolity of the conversation, remarks which exhibited sound sense and judgment. <laughs> He's like, finally, someone who can think. <laughs> It is impossible to set forth in any array of words the subtlety and peculiarity of poetry, which soars above the powers of language and defies the reach of description. Yes, said Isabella, the painter cannot place the rainbow or the glittering dewdrop upon his canvas. The sculptor cannot invest his image with a soul, and it seems equally difficult to define poetry. We know of what we are speaking when we allude to it, but there are no definitions which give us views of it sufficiently comprehensive. Well, strike me if I didn't think that everything with rhymes or in lines a certain length was poetry, observed the captain. <laughs> strike me. <laughs> My daughter can explain the mystery to you, said the countess, surveying Isabella with pride and maternal enthusiasm. Isabella blushed deeply. She feared that she had intruded her remarks on the company and dreaded to be considered vain or anxious for display. Markham immediately perceived the nature of her thoughts and skillfully turned the conversation to the poetry of her native land, and thence to the leading characteristics and features of Italian life. Dinner was at length announced, and Richard had the felicity of conducting the lovely daughter of the Count to the dining room, and of occupying a seat by her during the banquet. That's the end of that chapter! Um, Isabella is at, definitely being portrayed as a grown-up. So, again, in the 1830s, 16 was considered grown-up. They already, generally, if they were in society, they'd have a season and they'd be out on the marriage mart. I mean, not every single one was, but anyway, so uh, we're going to think of her in our modern minds as being more like 18. And uh, I see some potential here for uh, something happy on Richard's horizon. Let's cross our fingers. All right, I'll see you for the next chapter.